Welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us this afternoon at the New America Foundation. I'm Reed Kramer. I direct the asset building program here at the New America Foundation. And this is a public policy program that focuses on innovative ways to promote uh, economic security and social development, uh, especially uh, with policies and programs that promote savings and, and building up assets uh, over time. So we're very pleased that you could join us for this event, uh, facing up to the retirement savings deficit, from 401ks to automatic, actually to universal and automatic accounts. Uh, that's the title of the session today. And economic security really does depend on being able to access both income and a pool of assets. You build up a stock of assets that you can then uh, access at key points in the life cycle. Uh, there's a number of ways to do this, but primarily, <laughs> I think it's highly recommended to use the savings process as opposed to other things like you know gambling or paying the lottery. Uh, the savings process is really key. And we know families have multiple savings needs. Uh, they need to address unexpected events like a loss of a job. They need to save to pay uh, for strategic investments like accessing educational opportunities. Uh, and of course, they need to uh, save for a secure uh, retirement. Um, Retirement is an important uh, objective for many families, but it's just one of, of many. However, it is one that we, we do know is, is coming for most uh, people. And, and with the Great Recession, we've seen once again what happens when people don't have access to uh, resources, when there's a sudden loss uh, of income. Um, so my, my point is that income and assets are, are complementary, and uh, the assets play a role of, of mitigating risks uh, that families face. Uh, which is especially true in, in the retirement years. Um, of course, they're uh, uh, impacted by a lot of broader economic forces. Um, we've seen um, the fact that, that when asset bubbles are created and then they pop, uh, it's very debilitating for many families. It, it's also, on, on the upside, it, it's, I think, counterproductive because it makes the savings and asset building process appear a lot easier than uh, it actually is. Um, so uh, building assets takes time, and it's best when it happens over the life course. Uh, when we start early, when we integrate it into the work process and the pay process. Uh, and when we do this, there's actually a number of uh, attractive features of, of current savings plan structures, such as the 401k and, uh, and other programs uh, similar. Um, if we look at the current landscape, I think we can see a lot of things that are in flux. Uh, five years ago, we passed legislation that made some modest improvements uh, in, in the pension landscape, and the 401k landscape. Uh, we can uh, kind of assess those, but we still have a significant, very significant retirement savings deficit. Estimates uh, uh, about $6 trillion um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a deficit. Uh, the real crisis of retirement security is not, in my opinion, Social Security solvency, but it's the fact that Fewer Americans are participating in any savings plan. About half of workers are not covered in any savings plan. So uh, we, we clearly can look at the landscape. We know we're in this shift uh, to defined contribution uh, plans. Um, but it's still unclear if the resources in those accounts, in those plans, are going to be sufficient and commensurate to meet the expectations of, of retirees. Um, we also know that there are these major equity issues that I think are, are out there with millions of uh, people not participating at all. Uh, so to varying degrees, there's recognition of these problems and some progress is being made to address them. Uh, a number of very constructive uh, ideas have been put, put, put forth. Uh, we certainly have challenges in our political process of navigating this uh, landscape, but uh, we're not here to solve those problems today. Uh, we're here to have a constructive conversation about some uh, proposed solutions. Um, and we're going to start by focusing on one that was incubated in the think tank world, but has since been adopted by uh, the administration, the auto IRA proposal. And uh, very pleased to have Mark Ivory with us uh, to come and talk about the auto IRA and uh, to make the case. 
Uh, he's a senior advisor to the Secretary uh, um, uh, of the Treasury and the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Retirement and Health Policy, yes, at the U.S. Treasury. Um, and previously, he was principal at the Retirement Security Project, uh, along with Bill Gale and Peter Orzag and uh, David John. Um, and uh, he's really one of the most thoughtful people I know uh, on, on this, uh, working in this uh, issue area. So really pleased to have him here. Uh, but uh, with all good ideas, we think there are some ways to improve them. And in that spirit, um, Michael Calabrese is going to offer <coughs> a critique uh, which, which emphasizes ways to make the proposal uh, stronger. Uh, he's been a colleague of mine here at the New America Foundation for, for a number of years. Actually, he was here almost since the founding of this place uh, in 1999. And he's really added his voice uh, very constructively to uh, the retirement security debate uh, over that time. Uh, his remarks are treated a little bit more uh, um, fully in a paper we're releasing today uh, that's uh, outside uh, at the desk and available on the web uh, shortly. Uh, it's titled, uh, the subtitle is From Auto IRA to Universal 401k. So uh, we'll look forward to his remarks. And then we're going to have uh, kind of the panel discussion following these remarks, uh, really an all-star cast. Uh, they'll come up and share their perspectives and uh, talk about alternative approaches. We'll have Bill Gale who's the director of the Retirement Security Project at Brookings and uh, worked uh, incubating some of the ideas behind the auto IRA previously um, and uh, has also been promoting another concept of the flat rate uh, deduction scheme that he might uh, share with us. Uh, Teresa uh, uh, Gilarducci um, is going to join us. She is the director of the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis at the New School in New York, uh, a real leader in this uh, work, uh, author of a recent book called uh, When I'm 64, uh, the Plot Against Pensions and a Plan to Save Them. And then uh, David Serdna uh, will uh, join us, and um, he's the Director of uh, Federal Affairs at AARP. So they'll all share their perspective as well. Uh, so the format is we're going to hear from Mark, Michael, then the panel will come up, uh, make their presentations, and then I'll pop back up to moderate uh, the Q&A. So, Mark, okay, welcome. We, you know what, I'm going I'm to stay down here, <laughs> if that's okay. Uh, can you hear me in the back? Is this mic working? Yes, great. Uh, and I'm going to do that partly because I'll try to be quite brief and basically set up uh, this interactive dialogue, uh, starting with Michael's suggestions for how to improve and build on uh, the automatic IRA proposal, uh, uh, then uh, Teresa's ideas, which uh, include things like that, as well as different approaches which are very creative, um, uh, Bill Gale and uh, Dave Sertner, and then hopefully all of you. It's, it's a pleasure to be here, Reed, with you and with, with my four uh, very distinguished co-panelists, uh, as well as um, David John in the uh, uh, audience here, who uh, is uh, the co-author of this uh, uh, proposal uh, originally, a uh, senior fellow at the Heritage Foundation, um, and uh, as you mentioned, Reed, uh, this automatic IRA approach was developed uh, under the auspices of the Retirement Security Project, which uh, Bill Gale continues to direct and uh, has been uh, uh, adopted by the uh, the Obama administration and uh, introduced as legislation in the um, House, Representative Neal and others in the Senate, uh, Senator Bingham and Kerry and others, uh, and is, um, is in the process of uh, being reintroduced uh, in Congress this fall. Uh, I'll give you a brief rundown of what this proposal is. Reed's done a good job of motivating uh, it. Here's the problem. I'll pick up with what he said and uh, also rely on my co-panelists who have uh, very uh, persuasive points to make about the need uh, for uh, new solutions uh, to expand coverage and, and expand retirement security. Uh, we have currently, as you know, a system in which employers who wish to sponsor plans, sponsor plans, defined benefit, defined contribution, and employees or non-employees who are 
not covered by an employer plan, who don't have uh, the opportunity to participate in one, as well as some other employees, can use a kind of gap filler, the IRA, the Individual Retirement Account, to engage in tax-favored saving that is in the nature of what an employer plan provides in some respects. Uh, our take-up rate, the percentage of people who could participate, um, who actually do participate, is something like uh, three-quarters, two-thirds to three-quarters in the 401k universe generally. That's with traditional kinds of enrollment in 401ks. With automatic enrollment in 401ks, that is the opt-out approach where an employee is in unless he or she opts out, it tends to go up to 90, 95%. Very powerful uh, difference uh, and a very uh, successful way of increasing the eligible, the 401k eligible population who actually use the eligibility to avail themselves of the of the saving opportunity, but it does not reach the tens of millions of folks who are not employed by an employer that sponsors a plan. The take-up rate for a defined benefit pension is 100% of those who are eligible, uh, though an employer is not required to make everybody eligible in the first place, but is required to make a certain uh, proportion of employees pursuant to non-discrimination rules eligible. And the same is true of other employer plans, such as profit-sharing plans that are uh, non-matching, that involve employer funding, whether or not the employee takes any action. The take-up rate for IRAs, the kind of IRA that we have today, a standalone vehicle that an individual can open uh, with a, an IRA trustee or custodian, a financial institution authorized to do that, and can contribute to, the take-up rate there tends to be in the single-digit percentages, uh, a whole order of magnitude smaller than the 401k or DB or other employer plan take-up rate. That uh, means that we have tens of millions of folks who could be saving but aren't, largely for reasons that I think are reasonably evident. Some of them don't have enough disposable income to feel that they can put any money away, and that's a sort of fundamental fact. Uh, many others might be able to save a little bit, and we think that, in fact, many tens of millions are in this category, but it takes initiative. They have to make decisions and uh, go and open an IRA, which may require going down to a bank and waiting in line and filling out forms and deciding which type of IRA, a traditional or a, a Roth, and whatever that means, a complex kind of choice, what investments to, in, to, to invest in. Uh, lots of people are daunted by that, don't understand the investment options very well. There's a almost unlimited ar array of investment options in IRAs. And uh, uh, various other decisions, how much to contribute and when to contribute, that make it harder than necessary to save. The automatic IRA is designed to make it easy to save. The way automatic enrollment in a 401k makes it easy for an individual to get into the plan and easy to continue saving. There's not a liquidity problem. You don't have to come up with uh, a large amount or enough to satisfy a some minimum that a financial institution might have, you have payroll deduction working for you in the employer plan context. It can be a small percentage of every paycheck going into the plan in a relatively painless way. So the thought uh, behind this proposal has been to take advantage of those aspects of the current system that work relatively well, this payroll deduction workplace saving that gives the individual immediate access to the saving opportunity, the automatic enrollment in that uh, payroll deduction saving, and the individual account that is portable, that doesn't depend on 
where a person is working that a person can keep throughout their their working life and throughout retirement. And in this case, the IRA has been is what we've selected as the vehicle, partly because it's there, it exists, it's familiar. There are tens of millions of them already, um, so it makes a lot of the choices which one could make in different ways uh, about withdrawal rules, tax treatment, uh, contribution limits, and so forth. Taking those three building blocks and putting them together is really all this proposal is about. Any employer that sponsors a plan uh, goes in peace under this arrangement. An employer that has fewer than 11 employees, 10 or fewer employees, is not is, is encouraged with a tax credit to adopt automatic IRAs. And employers that have more than 10 employees, but that have not chosen to sponsor any kind of retirement program for their employees, would be uh, required to use their payroll system to make available their payroll system for employees to save their own salary reduction contributions in their own individual account. This is not uh, put forward as a total solution or a near total solution to the uh, needs that we have to save more and to expand coverage. Uh, there are many virtues of things like defined benefit pensions, um, lifetime income, uh, pooled investments, which this proposal tries in some measure to encapsulate or create a platform for. Pooled investments, there'd be a default kind of investment like the Labor Department's qualified default investment alternatives, uh, be it a target date fund or a principal preservation fund and a couple of other options. Uh, and those uh, options would ensure that people have the choice to invest in a principal preservation way safely uh, or to invest in an asset allocated way with diversified access to uh, equities and other types of assets. Employers would not have to contribute, indeed would not be allowed to contribute, and Michael will be raising an alternative, uh, uh, suggesting perhaps employers should be allowed to contribute. Um, uh, there may be suggestions that employers should be required to contribute. This automatic IRA does not do that because the idea is to work with the current employer system to support it and not to in any way compete with it. So the dollar limits are low. The idea is that employers will not have an incentive to abandon a qualified plan, whether it's DB or DC, 401k, in order to have an automatic IRA. Won't give them an excuse to abandon a plan because IRAs allow people to contribute $5,000 if they're over age 50, an extra $1,000, whereas the 401k allows 16,500, or for people 50 or older, 22,000, plus employer contributions that can get the total up to 49,000. And of course, other qualified plans uh, likewise allow comparable or greater contributions. So this is intended to fill a niche at the bottom of the savings ladder, if you will, to take the standalone IRA with its very low take-up rate very small percentage of people who contribute and make it much more accessible, easy to contribute to, uh, automatic for tens of millions of folks, including self-employed people, to the extent we can. Without a payroll system, it's more challenging, but automatic debit and uh, access to uh, IRAs that involve automatic debit, so there's regular automatic saving, um, is, a, is a way to help those folks. Um, uh, as are things like tax refund uh, savings in qualified vehicles. The uh, employers that participate would get a tax credit. Uh, the cost to the employer would be a very modest administrative cost. Former Joint Committee um, uh, staff have written a paper about that. Uh, ARP has looked into that as part of its support for this proposal. Uh, and it, it seems like an employer would have to do very little beyond what it currently does, and the intent is to design the details so that that would be the case. It has to withhold anyway for 
income tax, and FICA, FUTA, UI, uh, this would dovetail into, into that. Employees would have, be able to opt out or opt for a higher or lower level of contribution than the default level of contribution, and employees would be able to uh, send the money to uh, an IRA of their choice, if not initially, later. We'd like employers to be able to select a financial partner uh, at which to have all the IRAs if they want to, and if they don't want to, to give them an alternative that would let them send the money to one place uh, that is not, uh, doesn't require them to choose uh, an institution. No employer fiduciary liability with respect to investments because the investments would be of a type that's nationally prescribed consistent with what the, the core 401k uh, or federal thrift savings plan uh, kinds of investment options are today. Uh, there are more uh, specifics that one could flesh out, but in order to uh, make sure that we allow maximum time for everyone else, uh, including suggestions for improvement and um, questions and concerns. I'll uh, pause here and turn it over to Michael. All right. Well, thanks, Mark. Um, you know, I think all of us really appreciate Mark's efforts first in developing the auto IRA at Brookings, you know, with David and, and Bill and others, and now at Treasury trying to keep the issue at the forefront, really being the, um, uh, you know, continuing to be a champion for it. So, so thanks for that. Um, I, I, there's little doubt about the need to face up to what um, the Center for Retirement Research estimates is America's $6.6 .6 trillion retirement income deficit. So all the attention is on budget deficits these days. But as, as I, I was just hearing about some polling, maybe Teresa will talk about, you know, that that the folks out there are much more concerned about the retirement uh, gap than the budget gap. So Social Security has already surfaced in the debate about deficit reduction, but as Reed said at the top, the real retirement security crisis is not the solvency of Social Security. That's minor compared to the, to the problem that a majority of American adults, more than 75 million workers, do not participate in any workplace retirement saving plan at all. Uh, so they'll be overly reliant on Social Security. Um, only 43% of private sector workers aged 25 to 64 participated in 2008, a striking decline from the 50% rate in 2000 and still below the late 1970s. About 85% of Americans without a pension benefit at work are low income, young, work part time, or work at small firms. Unlike the days of defined benefit pensions, in a 401k nation, individuals must choose to save. However, below median wage workers are far less likely uh, to be eligible for a payroll deducted savings plan at work, and even when they are, the incentives to participate are far from compelling. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. As a result, the shift from DB pensions, which automatically enroll and contribute on behalf of uh, the full-time workers who are eligible, uh, that shift to 401k plans has coincided with a sharp decline in pension participation among lower wage workers in particular. The bottom half of the income distribution will continue to rely on Social Security for nearly all of their retirement income unless personal asset building becomes far more universal. Unfortunately, progress on enacting an auto IRA or any coverage expansion has lapsed into a sort of tactical retreat. A legislative push has been on hold, uh, not necessarily for bad reasons. First, in deference to a focus on enacting health care reform, you know, which thankfully was done. And now, because of the fiscal squeeze and the budget cutting agenda of conservatives in Congress. The Obama administration continues to support the auto IRA but it has also dropped an expanded and refundable savers credit from the President's uh, fiscal 2012 budget. Despite today's inhospitable political climate, we believe this is precisely the wrong time to trim our sails or back away from proposals to make our retirement savings system dramatically more inclusive, automatic, and secure. While this Congress will certainly not enact progressive pension reform, 
there are two broader debates that could prove to be an opportunity, and so we need to be ready, you know, with, you know, strong proposals. One is Social Security reform. If cutbacks are ever seriously on the table, so should be supplemental accounts that leave low- and middle-income families more secure, not less. A more likely opportunity, however, is tax reform. Each of the major fiscal commissions have agreed that tax expenditures need to be retargeted, reduced, or capped. And retirement, the, the retirement savings subsidy is one of those, one of the most expensive programs the government has, in fact. In the context of these coming debates, the auto IRA, as most recently proposed by the administration and in Congress, should be substantially more inclusive, more portable, and more likely to generate participation and asset building among the, the vast majority of middle and low wage workers. So the primary point of the paper uh, that we're putting out today is not to, um, not to reject in any, in any sense the auto IRA approach. Um, it's certainly going uh, totally in the right direction. But to highlight five ways to strengthen and improve auto IRAs. So the first, the first is inclusion. Every worker not, not currently eligible to save in their employer's plan should be included for automatic enrollment and payroll deduction or to be able to contribute directly uh, in the case of the self-employed or the employees of the very smallest businesses. Things like auto bank deposits, uh, designation of tax refunds or split refunds are ways to do that. Some auto IRA proposals potentially exclude one-third of the workforce. For example, exempting employ employers of 10 or fewer employees leaves out 18 million workers, just that, nearly 12 percent of the workforce. In addition, auto IRA proposals typically exclude all workers at firms that sponsor a qualified plan. However, these same firms employ between 10 and 15 million workers who are not eligible to participate in the employer's plan because they haven't satisfied the one-year service requirement. Remember, job, job tenure is averaging 4.4 years now. Or they are part-time, temporary, or otherwise contingent workers. There are also 16.5 million self-employed individuals who, again, you know, need that push. After inclusion, uh, the, sec the second uh, sort of I is incentives, stronger incentives. The federal government spends more than $125 billion per year on tax subsidies for, for retirement saving, but 70% of that flows to the most affluent 20%, and 40% goes to the top 5% by income. A deduction reduces the tax liability of a top bracket earner by 35 cents for each dollar saved. So you all are putting in 35 cents for every dollar a wealthy person saves. But nearly 45 million low and middle income tax filers who have payroll tax liability but no income tax liability receive no subsidy at all for saving. We should retarget saving incentives with a refundable matching credit deposited directly into the worker's account so that it you know, helps build the accumulation. The match rate should be, should be higher for lower wage workers who are least likely and able to save. Bill Gale will describe his similar proposal for a flat rate refundable credit to replace the current deduction. I, I like his proposal, but where um, I differ a bit is that I'd give uh, very low wage workers a dollar per dollar match uh, up to the first $2,000 saved. You know, I think they need, you know, both stronger incentives and simply more money in their accounts. Uh, a third way to strengthen the auto IRA is by adding a central clearinghouse to receive deposits directly from employers and from individuals not able to access auto payroll deduction. The clearinghouse would be a default administrator for small, unprofitable accounts, although individuals could roll out of it later after they have a certain amount of assets. By creating a career account that is always open, it would promote continuous saving and portability, particularly if you have complete inclusion. In fact, Australia's superannuation guarantee system a sort of mandatory universal 401k, which is considered a great success there. They just had some reforms and, and in fact, this year uh, implemented a clearinghouse after it was discovered that workers, their workers already had an average of, of more than three accounts each, including 6.4 million lost accounts, one for every two workers. 
that had over $12 billion in them that nobody knows quite what to do with. A fourth improvement would be to make sure that inertia is firing on all cylinders in favor of saving. Automatic enrollment is central to the auto IRA concept and very powerful, uh, as Mark pointed out, getting up to over 90 percent. But there are additional default features that need to be both required and robust and not left to the discretion of employers. They're not plan sponsors. They're simply facilitating payroll deduction. These include a higher default contribution rate. It should be 6 percent, not the 3 percent that's currently contemplated. Automatic escalation up to the 10 to 12 percent level, which is considered, you know, minimum to have adequacy, uh, assuming even continuous saving. Uh, automatic investment in an age-appropriate allocation between stocks and bonds, as, as, as Mark advocates. Automatic rollovers when a worker leaves a job. About half of, half of rollovers, m you know, most of the small ones, are cashed out. And automatic annuitization so that the default payout option during retirement is at least partially uh, guaranteed monthly payments rather than a lump sum. Uh, Bill Gale has a proposal for uh, trial annuities that I, that I think would fit you know, very nicely here and no doubt why he <laughs> is working on that. Finally, the fifth design uh, improvement would be to allow employer contributions and uh, a worker contribution limit that's higher than today's uh, $5,000 IRA limit. Employers that don't want the burden of administering a 401k may still be willing to make a contribution, perhaps as a bonus in a good year. Non-discrimination testing would be unnecessary if employer contributions are limited to a flat dollar amount or a flat percent of wages and includes all payroll employees, including part-time and contingent workers. In other words, again, it needs to be more inclusive uh, than currently it is for, for 401Ks. An auto IRA with all five of these more robust features would make our retirement savings policy, in our view, substantially more inclusive, more automatic, more adequate, and more equitable. So I'll st stop there, and uh, there's, of course, more detail in the paper. Um, so we'd like to get our other, our other three speakers up here. They, they haven't had to stare into the bright lights all this time, but expand the conversation. And you can use either the podium or from your seat, either way. I'll just stay here. Did you stay there? Sure. It's good enough for Mark and Michael. Okay. It's good enough. <laughs> yeah, I followed Mark's um, lead. I also don't want to uh, provoke any uh, undue attention from the gods above. The last time I was in this building, uh, in this room, actually, there was an earthquake. And so it was with some trepidation that I accepted Michael's uh, acceptance. Are you standing up? Uh, all right, thank you. Um, so uh, I want to talk about a one proposal that, that I had put forward with uh, Peter Orzak and John Karuber several years ago at least a variant of it in a Hamilton project paper. And uh, I recently testified on, on this as well, and so there, the testimony is out on the counter. What I'm going to talk about this morning is a, this afternoon is a little bit of a simplified version of this proposal. And let me just give you two uh, items of background um, before I get into it. In addition, let me say thank you to the organizers for inviting me and uh, uh, this, on this what was an important enough topic to risk earthquake exposure, uh, once again. Uh, first thing in the background, RSP has uh, several papers that people might be interested in. One is a paper that P Peter, Mark, and I wrote, I think in 2005, called the Automatic 401k, which takes the idea of going through automatic enrollment, automatic escalation, automatic rollover, talks about automatic annuitization a bit, but sort of punts on that. Uh, Mark and David, of course, have the classical paper on Auto, the classic paper on auto IRA, and then Mark David, uh, Lena Walker, who's at AARP, and I have this paper on trial annuities, which tries to think seriously if you want to do automatic annuitization, it's a really tricky thing. This automatic enrollment, if you get somebody at the wrong contribution level, 
6% rather than 3% or 3% rather than 6%, it's no big deal. They can just change it. Uh, automatic annuitization, if you stick someone in the wrong lifetime income uh, product, uh, uh, you can't undo those things by nature. This so our trial annuity proposal is an idea of, of how to kind of have your cake and eat it too to get people get a toe in the water, without committing themselves for long term. All right, so that's one point of the background. Second point of background on the four hundred one k front, the defined contribution front, or regular savings account IRAs. There's sort of two aspects to it as 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 I've looked at it, and other people, David, Mark, and others have looked at it. One is making saving easier. And that has to do with all, all the automatic enrollment and stuff like that. And the other is making it more rewarding. <clears throat> and that's what I want to talk about in the, in the time I have today. Um, as Michael mentioned, current, under current law, when someone contributes to the retirement account, they get an income tax deduction for that. So if, you're in the, if your marginal tax rate is 35%, you save 35 cents. If your marginal tax rate is 15%, you save 15 cents. If your marginal tax rate is zero, you save zero. Now, you still get, everyone still gets inside buildup on the, on the account. But in terms of the immediate contribution, the immediate incentive to save uh, hinges on your current marginal tax rate. All right, there are several concerns with this structure. Uh, one, it's upside down. The largest tax cuts, the largest immediate tax cuts go to the highest income taxpayers, and many people get no immediate deduction uh, from this at all. They, they, might, uh, they might get the savers credit, but they get no immediate uh, tax deduction. Uh, the second is that the, the subsidy comes back to the individual in cash rather than supplementing the contribution to the account. If what you want to do is encourage saving, it doesn't seem like the optimal thing to give people cash back, which they're most likely to spend, rather than put the money in account. Uh, the third thing is that the upside down structure subsidizes the wrong group, both on saving and equity grounds. Uh, the high income households are the ones that least need the subsidy, and the studies show that 401k contributions by higher income households tend to be more of the asset reshuffling type, that is moving funds around, taking advantage of the tax saving. Uh, whereas 401k contributions by lower or middle income groups happen less often, but when they do happen, they are more likely to represent net contributions, net additions to saving. Uh, and then the fourth problem is that this approach is quite expensive, uh, which is not ideal uh, in terms of either the medium term outlook or the, or the long term budget outlook. So the new proposal is pretty straightforward. It's in the notion of retargeting existing incentives uh, that Michael mentioned. And as I mentioned, it's a variant of a paper that Hamilton, the Hamilton Project put out and the RSP put out several years ago, and it's a somewhat simpler version of what I presented at Senate Finance a few weeks ago. And it's really simple. You take away the tax deduction for contributions to retirement accounts, and you replace it with what in the tax community we would call a flat refundable credit and in the retirement community, we call a government matching contribution. Okay, so right now, someone gives a dollar, they get uh, a 15 cent tax deduction from that. Say, under this proposal, they give a dollar, they wouldn't get the deduction, but they would get either, say, an 18% contribution to the count or a 30% contribution to the count from the government. Um, so the effects of this proposal relative to the current law, rather than being upside down with the subsidy rising with someone's income, uh, the subsidy is flat uh, with respect to income, so everyone is getting the same initial incentive to contribute. Uh, that in combination with the savers credit would give you a system somewhat similar to what Michael was talking about, where you, you're subsidizing low-income households almost one-to-one. -one. Uh, rather than coming back to the individual's cash, the match would go into the account. Rather than subsidizing high wealth asset shifters to the expense of low income households, uh, the, distribution, the contributions would be uh, evened out. Uh, and the proposal could generate a lot of revenue. If the matching rate is 18%, uh, which is the equivalent of a 15% deduction, and I can explain that if you want, uh, you'd raise about $250 billion over the next 10 years. Uh, if the matching rate were 30%, which is the equivalent of about a 23% income tax rate for a deduction, uh, the proposal would be revenue neutral over the next decade. So you can choose sort of, you can either retarget the proposal, keep it revenue neutral, or you can actually raise money, a significant amount of money, uh, while still preserving incentives, uh, uh, 
either the 18% uh, subsidy level would leave about uh, three quarters of the population either as well off as they are now or better off uh, and would inc impose tax increases on the top quarter. Um, so you can, there's a range of options. Uh, the other effects, the distributional effects, uh, are pretty straightforward. The proposal would shift resources from higher income households to lower income households by virtue of the fact that the credit rate was bigger than the tax rate for most households. Uh, it should raise private saving and with it national saving, as for example, the 18 percent credit rate uh, would stimulate some new private contributions and it would raise government savings. The 30 percent rate wouldn't affect government saving at all, but it would presumably stimulate a lot uh, of saving by individuals. And there's an interesting link to long-term budget reform here, which I'll mention. Uh, uh, if you think that Social Security and Medicare are going to ultimately face the Budget Act, the Budget Acts, like everything else is going to face the Budget Acts, then you particularly care about doing something to stimulate people to make up some of the gap to encourage retirement saving. Uh, so uh, the proposal is timely uh, in the sense of the sort of budget situation as well. Uh, last thing, let me just conclude. I view this as a relatively modest change to the system. It's just taking the Im individual deduction and converting it to uh, a matching contribution. Uh, there's no change in this version of plan to anything an employer does. Uh, everything else would stay as it is. Contribution limits would not change. Earnings would continue to accrue uh, inside, so they'd accrue tax-free. Uh, withdrawals from the accounts would continue to be taxed as regular income. The savers credit would continue to exist. Catch-up provisions would continue to exist. Uh, Roth and defined benefit plans would continue to exist. It's just this one change, changing the deduction to a, to a credit. Uh, that would, uh, I think, improve the distribution of retirement incentives, raise private and national saving, uh, and uh, get more people saving in the retirement system. So I'd be happy to discuss, explain, answer questions. Thank you very much. Oh, great. Um, I um, have nine points, and I think I only tell you this because when I say seven, I'll inspire hope um, and, uh, in, the, in the audience. Um, I'm really glad to be here. I look around the room and I see you know, very effective experts in this field. I see passionate advocates, and I'm, I'm just very honored that I was invited. Uh, thanks very much, Michael and, and Reed. Um, so I agree with the assessment here, and you, you heard it in various ways with Mark um, and with Michael, a little bit with Bill, that we do have a retirement crisis. I remember a conversation I had with a reporter for the New York Times, Green, um, Steve Greenhouse, um, who interviewed a lot of us, um, who said to me you know, over lunch, you know, I've never had a story like this. You know, maybe something like this about 20 years ago, but what I'm seeing here is that I talked to the experts on the left, the right, um, all these different um, schools and agencies, and you're all saying the same thing that low-income people, middle-income people, and high-income people are facing a retirement crisis. Low-income people, they're really afraid they're not going to have enough, and they're going to be even more poor than they are now. High-income people, they're panicked that they're going to live too long, and their investments aren't going to pan, pan out. And middle-class people have all three worries. Everybody is panicked. Number two, <laughs> um, we all agree on the causes. Of, of this retirement crisis. We have what turns out to be a poorly designed tax code with the unintended consequences of giving subsidies to people who need it the least. And also tax subsidies that are supposed to be incentives to people who don't need incentives to save for retirement. So it's both inefficient, not targeted to the right people, um, and it's not very effective to raise retirement um, savings um, security. We also have developed over the last 30 years a platform of commercial, um, individually, individually directed voluntary accounts in vehicles called 401ks and IRAs. And these vehicles are um, poorly designed. They are um, conflicted, a lot of conflict of interest, um, to the extent that they take 
um, income and fees from individuals who are saving in those vehicles and use that to lobby against fee transparency, they are a little bit corrupt and they also are very lightly regulated. In an era where defined benefit systems have been very heavily regulated and constrained, we see an era where contributions have um, limitations have only gone up and calls for regulation have been rebuffed. Um, so third, we um, also agree that the auto IRA is a very good um, step in the right direction of of correcting the tax code and correcting the um, flaws in the 401k and IRA system. I agree that Calabrese's robust design features go even one step beyond the auto IRA platform or um, skeleton of an idea and have actually made improvements in areas of increasing contributions by having a, de a default contribution that moves up from three to six, that's in the right direction, by um, having a more generous savers credit envision, that's in the right direction, to make government subsidies more efficient, to have a default, a default investment option goes in the right direction of moving away from self-directed um, accounts um, towards more appropriate <coughs> portfolio allocation. And moving towards a default annuities goes much further than what we see now where people can reti accumulate retirement savings in order to have a secure retirement income for life. That's what the tax code's about. That's what our goals are. And so default annuitization goes in the right direction. And last, um, he, um, Calabrese, provides a design feature that helps employers who have good hearts, want to do the right thing, have a practical business model for providing retirement security, but find the IRA, the 401k, and the DB platform too awkward and not attractive, gives employers an easy way to contribute to, an easier way to contribute to their employers, all in the right direction. But as you might guess, <laughs> I feel that uh, the steps aren't um, adequate, that they're not moving towards where we need to go. Fortunately, an organization called Retirement USA, which is a coalition of advocates and researchers who are dedicated towards providing secure and adequate pensions for all Americans, have established the principles of what a good reform, pension reform system would look like. Th there are 12 principles. And they're all very well thought out. I've really combined them into four, and they're in really um, four categories. Principles that yield adequate accumulation, that's the A. Um, principles that yield appropriate investments, that's the I. And principles that advocate the appropriate payout. Um, and we, the fourth, the, that's the third principle. The fourth set of principles is that the government, Paul, is good government principle, that government subsidies should be targeted to the right people and incent retirement income. So five, I see that, my, my fifth point is that Calabrese's robust design alternatives really don't go far enough in all four areas. Um, first, the um, contributions are defaulted. It's still a voluntary system. And I'm told by people who want my program to be advocated that I shouldn't use the word mandate, especially when I'm in Washington. So I'm going to use the word universal, but you'll all know what I mean. <laughs> all right. um, the only principle that makes sense to get adequate um, savings is if there's a mandate, just like Social Security and just like in, in defined benefit systems. Um, people need to save at least 17 to 20 percent of every dollar they earn in order to have adequate retirement um, policy. Social Security gets you up to 12. You need to top it up with seven and, um, or eight or more. Um, Self-directed um, investments in commercial accounts that are voluntary have three things wrong with them. They're self-directed, they're commercial, and they're voluntary. Um, if we default our retirement savings into 401ks and RAs, there are going to be excessive leakages in fees, in bad choices. And auto um, annuities means that some people will still opt out of annuities and you have the adverse selection problem of the people that want the annuities are going to have to pay a lot for it and that won't be adequate enough. 
So there's too many leakages, six, there's too many leakages left with even the robust uh, improvements on the auto IRA. So we need number seven, is my seventh point, you should all be happy, um, is that we need guaranteed retirement accounts. They need it to be uh, universal, <laughs> that people have to put a universal, everyone needs to top up their Social Security with 5% more um, um, savings into their retirement accounts. That can be, that's shared by the government, by employers, and by people, um, by individuals. There should be a guaranteed option, just like I have in my TIECREF plan. I'm a professor. I can go into TIE, and I, for the past 60 years, me and my colleagues, have gotten 2.9% guarantee up to 4.2%. There's a, ra a guaranteed range, and um, um, economists and uh, literary scholars get to put their money there and then we just go do our jobs and don't worry about it. Uh, we need to have a guaranteed option. Uh, we need to mandate annuities. That's just, that's just, oh, uh, mandate. Universal annuities, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, because any lump sum withdrawals have the adverse selection problem and people spend it too fast. Number eight, um, the politics are such that we may not get anything done in Congress at the federal level, even though auto IRAs and the robust design issues have a federal, and I used to, have a federal uh, plan. Social Security collects it, and then the TSB distributes it. I'm, I'm, I've given up. About nine months ago, I've gone to the states. Just two weeks ago, it just so happens that I was speaking before a small group of legislators and academics and labor and some employer folks about creating something that the New America um, Foundation, w using Mark Avery's ideas, actually incubated in California about five, six years ago. Mark Klein, who is your representative, New America Foundation representative in California, was, was our moderator. To have the possibility that private sector money would be managed by CalPERS, CalSTRS, and other robust institutional investors. So today, as we're here, Bill Lockyer, the um, state treasurer of California, is at a CalPERS conference suggesting California guaranteed retirement accounts, that private sector money be collected through the unemployment insurance platform, because they have to, employers have to pay into that system anyway, sort of the equivalent of Social Security. Employers send the check anyway, and CalPERS um, will run the money. Um, this is being discussed in New York State, in Connecticut, um, in the State Treasurer of Pennsylvania has approached, uh, approached me. There's 50 states, there's many other ways that we could actually design something that looks like an IRA, a robust, a robust IRA, or a, um, or a, um, a guaranteed retirement account. Um, last, <laughs> um, I think the time has come for a universal <laughs> top up to Social Security. Um, poll, polling um, firms that were hired by the Rockefeller Foundation for Rockefeller grantees who were working in this space reported to us and told us that, just like Greenhouse said, hey, this is the first time in a couple of decades where the people are ahead of the politicians. When we go out there and ask people, do they want the government to solve the jobs crisis, the health insurance crisis, or, or, or pay attention to retirement security? We were surprised, this is in 2009, the biggest recession since the Great Depression, that people said, not jobs, not health care, solve this retirement um, um, crisis. And retirement insecurity ranked the largest among, wait for it, politicians, middle class and high income people who are likely to vote. So it is time that at some level of government, we start talking about Social Security Plus and um, mandating, mandating um, more money dedicated to retirement security. Uh, thank you, and <clears throat> again, thanks New America for having this forum and inviting me here as well. And I, I do want to echo some of my colleagues here in talking about really the re retirement crisis that I think we're, we're facing and will face even more so in the future. And just to quickly go back why, why that's the case, you know, over the last couple of decades, what have we really seen? We've seen really a, probably a reduction or at least a shrinkage in, in pension plans and certainly a switch over to 401k plans, which uh, do not appear to be delivering anywhere kinds of near the security that the traditional defined benefit plans uh, did. Um, 
even a typical 401k account balance is is under $100,000, uh, to put that in uh, sort of a Social Security term, a, a Social Security lump sum equi equivalent is about three times that much money. So you can see there's not a whole lot of bang for the buck coming out of many of these plans. Um, savings rates have been down, uh, except for the last few years when people have been afraid to spend. Our savings rates were hovering around zero. Uh, people's uh, largest or second largest assets, their homes, have obviously taken a, a tumble in value. Uh, there's been volatile markets and, in fact, fairly a, a fairly flat market over the last 10 years uh, for people who have been trying to save. Uh, we've seen high unemployment, which, of course, has led to um, more stagnant wages, making it more difficult for people to save. We've seen high health care costs, which both squeeze out uh, wages, increases, and, and the ability to save for people who are working and also consume a lot of the uh, retirement assets when people uh, do retire. And of course, so this, what does it mean? We have a lot more people getting to re retirement with a lot less. And of course, uh, they're living longer. Very bad combination. So what are the shortcomings that we have in our pension system? Well, I think I beat your nine. I had about 10 uh, shortcomings that people talk about uh, often in our pension system. Uh, and they say, well, wouldn't it be great if we could, could deal with these shortcomings? Well, what are the shortcomings? Well, one, wouldn't it be great if we had a plan that covered everybody? Uh, wouldn't it be great if we had a plan that was completely portable, went with you from job to job? Wouldn't it be good if we had a plan that had uh, minimal investment risk, because so you didn't risk uh, losing in these down markets? Wouldn't it be good if we had a, a more progressive benefit structure or more progressive subsidies? Uh, wouldn't it be good if we had lifetime protection, uh, so make sure you didn't run out of your money? Uh, wouldn't it be good if these uh, accounts in retirement actually could be adjusted for inflation so they wouldn't lose value over time? Uh, wouldn't it be good if we could make sure you couldn't cash out that money uh, before you retired so you actually would have the money for retirement? Uh, wouldn't it be great if this system really came with fairly low uh, administrative costs? Uh, and wouldn't it be good if we also protect spouses in this system? Uh, and it would be good if we had employee contributions as well. Uh, and by the way, it would be great if we also had broad public support and acceptance of this kind of a system. And so, you know, you tick off all these issues and all these problems, and you come back to, well, wait a second. We've got a great system in this country now that does all that. And Social Security meets every one of those objections to some of the current shortcomings of the pension system. So we're having this backward conversation right now about taking the system that works best and trying to reduce it and trying to replace it with supplements from any of these other systems which uh, can fill in but all have some of the shortcomings. So it's really important as a critical first step when we're talking about retirement security is really sort of the get back to the fundamental. The one plan that delivers the foundation for everybody is Social Security and we're having a backwards conversation about how do we reduce benefits in that system rather than how do we maintain them. I haven't even heard anybody talking about maybe that's a good way to increase benefits, but even just talking about trying to maintain the benefits that we have. And we've done polling and asked people about Social Security benefits and say, well, do you think Social Security benefits are too high, too low, or about right? You get about a 50-50 split between uh, too low and about right. I mean, nobody says Social Security benefits are too high. So given what, and we know that public strongly supports Social Security. We know that crosses uh, age lines and income lines and party lines. Uh, and so we really need to fundamentally to uh, protect the Social Security benefit as the foundation. Now still, Social Security benefit on average only pays about $14,000 uh, a year. So it is not an overly generous benefit by any measure. And so we do need to try to supplement Social Security. I mean, the reality is today that we have uh, roughly one in four retirees live on Social Security for basically for all their income, 90% or more. And everybody understands Social Security is the most important low-income program we have in this country in terms of keeping people out of poverty. But people, I think, forget sometimes how important Social Security is for middle-income people. And by middle-income, I'm talking about way up the income scale, uh, at least until you get to the top 20%. Uh, Social Security will be by far the largest source of income for any of those folks in that broad middle. Uh, and the average senior today has an income of, of roughly $20,000. So that gives you a sense of what a $14,000 uh, Social Security benefit means for most people in terms of uh, income protection. So it's really critical uh, to have that solid base. And any of these kinds of accounts we're talking about as supplements will really work, I think, fundamentally much better when you have that solid base. It's a, li a little better when you have a solid base that's a guaranteed lifetime and in inflation protected base to then have a supplemental account that perhaps has a little more investment risk, that perhaps has some people get access to it before retirement, uh, or do some of the other things that we, we know uh, basically cut against having a, a, a good uh, supplement in retirement. 
Um, so it's really pretty critical. Now, some of the supplemental plans we're talking about, and, and ARP has endorsed concepts, for example, like the auto IRA, are meant as kind of fill-ins and, and substitutes and to build on the current system we have with Social Security as a base, and then we have other supplemental plans like IRAs and 401k plans. Now, those plans certainly have their shortcomings in terms of the number of people who sign up and use them. But we try to build on some of the things we know that have happened out there in the real world. For example, why are 401k plans used a lot more than IRAs? Well, of course, they're very simple, and they're done through payroll deduction. That's the way people mostly like to save. Take the money out of my paycheck. I don't want to see it. That way works the best. So, so any of the supplemental plans that we're talking about that build on using that kind of payroll deduction mechanism and having this done automatically are going to work a lot better than something like an IRA where you have to, you know, every April or so with your tax return, come up with the money to contribute to an account. That's not going to work as well. Um, but still, these amounts are probably going to be small, uh, given all the other problems we've been seeing and, and I've outlined. But a lot of people think, well, if it's small, it's not important. Well, I, I would disagree with that. I, I, th I think given where we are and, and the needs and the fact that Social Security is modest, even having a, a relatively small additional supplemental account is critical. I mean, it would be great if we can get that money in early and build it over a lifetime, but even if we have small amounts going in or we don't even start putting money in until a little later when people actually start thinking about retirement, building up smaller supplemental accounts are really going to be pretty critical. And uh, I'm all for using all of the, some of the strategies that have been already mentioned up here, particularly the, the uh, you know, I, and I, I fault Ben Franklin for this because he talked about, uh, you know, a penny served, saved as a penny earned. It should have been a penny saved as a penny compounded. Uh, it would have been a lot better. But using the power of inertia uh, is really important. So making sure that we're, when people do nothing, they do the right thing, as opposed to today when people do nothing, they do the wrong thing uh, in terms of automatic enrollment and, and putting you into good default options, uh, for example, and even maybe default payout options uh, can really make a lot of sense and help. And we also do have a saver's credit on this country that is in part designed to go with things like supplemental plans like automatic IRAs because they will encourage people like a match uh, people who have modest incomes to contribute to plans. And, you know, the saver's credit, uh, of course, is fairly modest and it does cut out fairly low in the income scale. And it would be nice if we could expand that. Um, but those will help incent people to save as well as put more money in plans. And so those are all sort of critical pieces. Uh, but I do have to emphasize again, these pieces only work when you have the strong base of Social Security. So whenever we talk about retirement security, it's always, I think, important to go back and think about that base and what we're doing to that base before we even move on to the next step of the uh, supplement. So thank you. All right, excellent. A lot to chew on here, and I, I want to give uh, actually Mark an opportunity to, to respond to some of those those comments and uh, get some exchange with the, the panel and, and take some of your, your questions. Um, but actually, first, I, I wanted to start with something where, where David really ended, which is kind of focusing on some of the automatic features that are, that are out there. I, I think there's great promise here. Uh, we know that enrollment is really foundational, and we also... Uh, have learned a lot of insights from the behavioral economics field, and um, defaults uh, are very powerful. They really set a lot of the, the trends, and inertia is very powerful as well. So we've got to get the defaults right. Um, and uh, let's start with the, uh, that kind of discussion, maybe, Mark. We, we, we know um, a range of ideas that, that are out there. Uh, the, the current policy had a 3%. Had a uh, we've had a critique of 6 A um, little bit of your insights on that issue and, and uh, wh where some of the um, policy uh, discussion can go from there. Uh, sure, Reed. happy to, to address that. Uh, I think we would all like to see people saving uh, at much higher rates uh, to the extent that a defined benefit kind of pension or other <coughs> uh, non-elective pension <clears throat> does not already cover their needs, and uh, double digits, as folks mentioned. Uh, 10, 12, I think, uh, Michael, you were referring to that, or indeed higher percentages of pay uh, are really what people need if they're relying on a defined contribution plan um, for um, most of their supplement to as David said, the, the critical foundation uh, of Social Security. Uh, the choice of a default contribution rate yep. is um, 
really a matter of what the market will bear in terms of what people can get used to. In the 401k world, in the late 90s, uh, Treasury defined this notion of automatic enrollment, uh, approved it under the 401k laws, and illustrated it by way of promoting it with a 3% contribution rate. The 3% wasn't thought by us to be adequate. Our thought was, this is a bit of a revolutionary idea. We want to introduce it gently and make sure that we don't get uh, ideological or political blowback that could upend the whole concept from the outset. And that, whether it was necessary to illustrate it at 3% or not, it seems to have helped uh, to have the whole idea go over well, and we have such broad now ideological buy-in to the concept of enrolling people automatically and giving them the choice to opt out or opt for a lower or higher contribution. In 401ks, to your point, Michael and Reed, um, <clears throat> we've encouraged, and, and Bill Gale, David John, Peter Orzag, and I have encouraged and uh, when um, uh, uh, I and Peter were part of the Retirement Security Project, as, as Bill and David still are, 6% or 5% uh, starting contribution rates for 401k plans. You don't get much of a drop-off, uh, very little opt-out increase when you start at 5 or 6 rather than 3, and escalation. Every year, add another percent or 2%, uh, could be when people get raises, um, uh, and if employees want to opt out of the escalation, they can. And let it escalate past 10% if the employer is willing to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, so people get used to the idea. It's all a matter of uh, where one wants to strike a balance uh, in terms of getting, gaining acceptance and retaining acceptance. That's why the automatic IRA legislation authorizes the regulators to use a uh, between a two and six percent contribution rate uh, instead of the initial sort of placeholder default of three percent, consistent with Michael's thought here, and to escalate over time. Um, if we can start with that, you know, if there is enough of a consensus, that's great. But a lot of these people have never saved before, and uh, a lot of the employers. Uh, they haven't sponsored a plan. Mm -hmm. And so their willingness to go along with this um, when they're not 401k sponsors to begin with um, uh, may be much greater if we start gently. Uh, yep. Comments? The only good counter argument I've heard on a higher um, initial rate is that in 401ks they'll say, okay, there's not much drop off from 5 or 6%. That is the average, just under 6% in 401ks. But some people will say, well, that's because the typical employer matches, um, you know, 50 cents on the dollar up to 6%. Uh, but I'm thinking that, you know, about the other features, that if we have a strong uh, uh, tax matching credit up to $2,000, then, for example, if you're, if you're matching, whether it's dollar per dollar or 50 cents on the dollar, the first two thousand dollars, then for somebody who's earning thirty-three thousand, that's six percent. So they have to save six percent in order to to, or they're leaving money on the table, just like somebody in a four hundred one k. So that makes the you know the six percent level more reasonable. Mm -hmm. And the and the um, the notion of a uh, robust matching contribution uh, as in the form of a tax credit uh, is something that. Uh, I think uh, is uh, uh, really an important idea and something that uh, has you know, traveled uh, uh, as separate legislative, as a separate legislative proposal uh, on Capitol Hill uh, from the automatic IRA, but one that, as Michael and and Bill and 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 uh, others have described, has often been thought of in in tandem as one helps make saving easier. The other makes, helps make it more remunerative for the people who need that additional financial incentive. Yeah. Um, all right, we will take uh, questions from, from the audience. Uh, actually, we're going to steal one of the mics from up here 
and uh, pass it around. So let me know if you have uh, questions. Just flag uh, them for me. Raise your hand. Uh, I actually, uh, before, uh, wanted to ask Bill uh, a little bit about his um, proposal. He kind of described it as simple. It's not fundamental. You kind of talked about the continuity, but it does seem like it would be a lift. And uh, it could be done, though, in the context of a tax reform uh, discussion uh, that might be uh, emerging in the, uh, in the foreseeable future. Uh, I also think we might be able to use this opportunity to um, simplify some of the complex rules that are associated with these types of accounts, like IRAs, where uh, we have uh, a lot of different uses, uh, qualified uses for these accounts. And um, there is some concern that you kind of commingle retirement with other things like saving for uh, home ownership or paying for education that, that cause some complexity, and some call it leakage. But those are the rules. Um, so how do you see your proposal working in kind of a tax reform discussion, and what else would you like to see as part of that process? All right, thanks. The, <clears throat> the reason that I think of it as a simple proposal is precisely because it doesn't delve into any of those it doesn't change the structure of IRAs. It doesn't change the withdrawal rules. It doesn't change the 401k structure, all the stuff that, that David raised about wouldn't it be nice if. It doesn't, it doesn't deal with any of those. It's not that those things aren't important issues. They are. They're very important. But this particular proposal, which Michael asked me to talk about today, just deals with the deduction and the credit thing. So uh, I think it could – I think that's in, in some ways an advantage in the – current setting uh, because it's sort of clean it doesn't get into the whole set of debates that are interesting but that might hold it up so. but it does enter introduce some equity kind of issues that um, are going to be part of the tax reform discussion as well at some point that's yes. right and it, it introduces a national saving issue and a mm -hmm. budget reform issue right. and, and so on so. okay all right let's uh, start right here and then in the back and other hands? Let's see. There you go. Okay. Hi. I'm Dr. Caroline Poplin. Um, my late husband was Martin Slate, the director of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation in the Clinton administration. And my question is, I, th the proposals all sound fine. Um, the, co the context always seems to be the American people aren't saving enough. I just wonder with a 49% Median household income, forty-nine thousand dollar median household income. Um, whether a ten percent contribution per year is really realistic, while everything else is going up, housing costs have go are going up, insurance costs are going up, health insurance costs are going up, right. tuition is going up. Right. Um, so, how do you get the savings process started? That's what you want to know. Well, it's easy enough to start at one or two percent. The question is, can you save enough? to to ensure a decent retirement. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Teresa? Yeah, um, we've all been really concerned about um, not decreasing consumption of people who are, are strapped for all the reasons that, that you've mentioned. And that's the reason why all of us here envision um, the tax subsidy, which is very substantial at higher incomes at, at five, I think it was the latest figure I saw was 5,700 for the very top. Um, actually be redistributed so that the tax credit would pay for most of the contributions of those low-income folks. Yeah, that's one reason I'd like to see, you know, in what I described, see money coming from, you know, yeah. uh, three sources, you know, s some money coming from, obviously the worker is going to have to contribute, but then the employer, if they can, you know, to the extent they can match, um, and, of course, a matching tax credit, Teresa's guaranteed retirement accounts have all three baked in, uh, and, and you know, and I think we'll need all three. That way, you could get to the ten percent potentially with the worker putting in, you know, four percent when they're down around in income around thirty-three thousand. And again, I go back to just two things I said. One, you know, to the extent that it's coming out of the paycheck automatically, people will become accustomed to what they have and what they can spend, and it'll become part of their you know everyday expenses. It can be done. At a 10% level, at that level, maybe not. But going back to what I said earlier, given what people are going to have in retirement, if having a consistent saving even of 3% over a lifetime is, is going to make a big difference to them at the end because they're not going to have much else. I mean, we hear a lot of complaints from people when they get to retirement. The one complaint we never hear is, I, oh, uh, you know, I save too much. 
in my lifetime. You just nobody says that. Yeah. So just to follow up on that, you the um, there is a fundamental trade-off between consumption now and consumption later, and and part of the reason that the government faces these big medium-term, long-term deficits is because government programs have promised things that that we as a society have been, for whatever reason, been unwilling to pay in current tax revenues. Uh, the flip side of that is the individual situation where Michael mentioned retirement crisis, which is the same, the same issue. People, if you think, have liabilities to themselves, if you want to think of it that way, that they're not willing to set aside money for right now or not able to set aside money for right now. Uh, and it's the reason these things are so pervasive and so big is precisely the issue you mentioned. It's a hard trade-off to make, and and you know we shouldn't we shouldn't pretend otherwise. I'd like to challenge my colleagues too to think about the redistributive effects of a guarantee. Um, if we don't have a guaranteed option, and everybody has to. Um, construct their own portfolios, you're going to have lower income people choose safer options and therefore taking another sacrifice of, of their current consumption. So if you care about those bottom um, three quintiles, um, then a guarantee and the redistribution of the tax um, subsidy then helps um, those families now and later. I also think it makes sense to start the process as early as possible. And at the New America Foundation, we promote the idea of starting at birth give every kid an account when they're born and use that as the savings vehicle. Uh, that could be another discussion. Okay, we, here? Just, just yeah, before please. go to the next question, just uh, uh, on a personal note, um, many of you um, may not have had the, the pleasure of knowing Marty Slate, but uh, Dr. Poplin's uh, late husband was uh, really an outstanding public servant and thought leader in this area. Uh, was uh, one of the senior people at IRS in the pension field, <coughs> headed up their pension division, and was uh, the executive director of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. Um, so um, it's, it's very appropriate that uh, I think we remember him on this yes, occasion. Thanks for acknowledging him. Thank you. Okay, back there, and then we'll move through. Um, I agree that it's, you know, any little bit of savings is good savings, but if you're going to have investment options for people to put their money into, you can put your money into it. There are plenty of people who are, at this point, you know, when the market dropped last year, had put a ton of money away <laughs> and put it in investment accounts. And when they got ready to retire, it wasn't quite what they thought it was going right. to be because of the investment aspect. So absent of putting it in a guaranteed rate that has inflation protection to it, it you know, I mean, y y you talk about giving people an option, but you can still do all of that you're saying to do, and if they put it in an investment account, even if it's in a life cycle fund, if it's invested in equities, there could be a chance of the money right. still decreasing in value. So is the solution just to allow just one, you know, one fund with a guaranteed rate with inflation protection, or? Maybe, Teresa likes that one. Yeah, that's the, the wobbly uh, leg of the stool. Comments? That's a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> it's interesting to think about how some other countries have dealt with this. I mean, what, there's sort of a range of options. At one end, from you're on your own. You know, you put your money in the account, and whatever the market does, that's what you get. That's the yo-yo. The yo-yo, yes. yes. You're on your own. Uh, the other end is a, a, a guaranteed, explicitly guaranteed return, which moves the risk to the government uh, or, or whoever is guaranteeing that return. Uh, a third option, and David, correct me if I'm wrong here, but the Netherlands in particular has these uh, the sort of, I would describe them as pooled defined contribution plans, which kind of gives, a, gives people a, uh, I don't know, kind of a time averaging uh, effect that, that is a way of reducing the variability uh, while at the same time, uh, at, the, at, at an individual level, while at the same time as giving individuals access to, uh, to the investment expertise that comes from a pooled resource. I'm not advocating that as a specific alternative so much as highlighting the idea that there's a range of issues here. You're absolutely right to focus on the rate of return uncertainty and availability of investment options. Uh, and it seems like this is an area where, A, we could do a lot better, and B, we might be able to learn something from other countries who have faced similar issues. We are generally behind the curve 
on these issues relative to other countries. At least that's 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 my impression. I really have to say we don't have to go to Europe to find those examples. Um, we have them in TICREF, I just said, that um, it ranges at 2.9 to 4.2. The trustees over 60 years smoothed out the, um, the fluctuations of the financial markets. Also the state of um, Indiana, Ohio, um, Wisconsin, and to somewhat Nebraska has this option for their public employees that they can have their D their 401k type money run by the DB institutional investors, and those rates of returns are smoothed out too. So it's it's there's an American you know example. We don't have to be all yeah. Frenchy. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah yeah okay there and then back sorry. Um, because it does seem that Congress is not doing anything. I was really interested in the. Uh, are you saying it's a do-nothing Congress? Yes. Yes, I am. Okay. Um, I was very interested in the mention of states, going to the states, and I had a couple questions. One, process-wise. Two, does it only include public employees? And three, is there somewhere we can get more information? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this, this idea was hatched here at the New American Foundation and also in the brains of, of Mark Avery. The idea was a private sector money would be run by the, insti by the institutions that states are already set up which are good institutional DB for managers. We've always talked about it as that everybody deserves access to BlackRock, to State Street Bank, to Barclays Global Investments, to hedge funds, to private equity, to some of the more sophisticated real estate funds. And now 401k and IRA participants don't have access to any of those professional investors um, and at the fees that institutional investors do. So it's private, it's private money. Um, uh, yes. My name is Lee Yang. Uh, I think of retirement saving, the purpose is uh, for them to really save and really obtain the fund at the end when they need it. The problem is, uh, I wonder if you have a study the existing program, whether it is a uh, TIA craft or whether it is a a 401k or IRA, whatever. So uh, I just wonder if, because current system, the financial <laughs> institution, they really take away people's property, including all those savings accounts. Yep. And uh, if you can re also protect their home ownership or their uh, other, other savings account or checking account, uh, if you can improve the financial institution, which is now in big trouble, so I just hope I mean, if you have studied these type of things, whether they consumers or taxpayers should really get something. Other than that, the taxpayer will be forced to tighten their waist belt, and uh, eventually, even when they are older, or even they are they are they are. They are, they are what I mean is the distribution at the end of 70 and a half, yeah. Yeah. they don't get anything. Right. Yeah. And okay, even, so dead, even they are dead, the, <coughs> the, 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 young, the younger generation still don't get anything. Yeah. Yeah. All right, what, what David. What I wanted to mention is we, we did a certain, and obviously a, a bad economy obviously hurts everybody and everything, but, but one of the things that we saw in a survey we did recently was that uh, one out of four people had exhausted all their savings. So when you run into financial troubles as an individual, uh, you know, you're going to begin to tap into your savings, including your retirement savings. So you know, it's not just the devastation of people sort of losing a job and not being able to save anymore, but actually having negative savings that they're digging into what they have. So you know, we have a lot of people in this country without any form of savings whatsoever right now. All right, we're going to take one more question right here in the front. Uh, thanks for uh, your time and uh, from the panel and from, from the audience. Thank you. Last Thank question. you. I'm, uh, Don First with the American Academy of Actuaries. Um, I want to ask you, the, the creation of all these universal accounts would create many, many small accounts. One of the criticisms of small accounts is that they're often very expensive and that the fees are very high. Yes. So I, I, I want to ask the question in two regards. Would, I, would you propose or support any type of mandatory fee structures or mandatory transparency of fees so that people really knew what they were paying for these things. And secondly, would, would you encourage in any way any economies of scale through very large providers 
or are you going to let every local bank offer right. these mandatory accounts, which I would expect yeah. would be relatively high yeah, cost? Yeah, no, I think uh, assets under management is obviously a key to the game, so you can enable some cross-subsidy to, uh, to occur. And that happens in the thrift savings plan at the federal level, and it happens in some of the larger uh, 401k plans. Um, but comments on that, Teresa, Michael? 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 Yeah, well, with, I mean, the, definitely the transparency, whoever is managing. But, uh, but that's why I was saying that we need, you know, a clearinghouse, um, essentially a TS, thrift savings plan uh, approach, uh, and, and at least initially where the, you know, where the deposits are directed, you know, and you could have an option uh, where people, you know, after it reaches a certain size, you could have the option to roll it out. Maybe there's a window each year if you want to roll it to a private, uh, to a commercial provider. And, and actually, the, the original um, bills that were introduced on the auto IRA back in 2007 were based more, a little bit more in that respect on the Pension Rights Center uh, proposal, you know, which, which was to have a clearinghouse. And so they would have set up a, a you know, a TSP2 to manage these small accounts with, with extremely streamlined, simple, just, a, you know, just like TSP, just a handful of, um, of index funds and you know very few bells and whistles etc and i think that's the place rather than let the employer choose you know a a financial institution for you and you end up in the australia situation where you have three four five accounts after 20 years you know let all the money go to that clearinghouse and then give the individual the choice to roll it out later maybe the 2007 legislation said after your balance was at least 15,000, you could have that option periodically but that would be a much more efficient way to aggregate. And, and it doesn't mean you can't contract that out to the private sector to manage. That's what TSP does yeah. more or less anyway. And uh, Michael's clearinghouse idea is described in even a little bit more greater uh, detail in the, in the paper. Uh, and, uh, but essentially, it, it really builds on this savings plan model uh, as a way to kind of aggregate the, uh, the auto IRAs uh, that are out there. Um, all right, well, thanks uh, to the panelists. Thank you for your time, uh, and good afternoon. Thank you.